Welcome, friends. Uh, this is our Q&A show, Going Deeper, where we get to sit down with some of our staff and pastors here at MRCC and dive a little bit more into some of our different ministries and sermons that we have here. So uh, if you're coming back, thank you and welcome back. And if you're new, thank you for joining us. Um, we have with us Pastor Greg today, uh, and we're going to be discussing the sermon Headphones, mm -hmm. where we're encouraged yeah. to learn how to listen to the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And... Uh, this is kind of a, a topic that I was excited to, to get into a little bit. So kicking us off, you know, many believers have at least maybe some level of confusion about who the Holy Spirit is. Yeah. Uh, and we might get the impression that he started working when Jesus said, it's good that I'm going away because I'm sending the counselor or Holy Spirit in my place. Yeah. So was the Holy Spirit sort of manifested then and there or was the Holy Spirit always working? How does that work? Yeah, I, he was always there. And I think may, maybe the way to, to kind of open this subject up is to understand that God, you know, by his very nature being God, unique yep. in the universe, uh, infinite, etc., naturally transcends our ability to understand him fully. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, to put it another way, there's always more of God. Yeah. Right? It doesn't mean we can't understand some things, but the more we understand, there's still more, right? Yeah. So the Holy Spirit kind of, he's the third person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. three persons, one God, not three gods, uh, unlike anything else in, in creation. And the Holy Spirit is the one uh, who kind of in a lot of ways represents his transcendent nature. Right. Okay. So he is uh, spirit is the biblical word. Uh, you know, how do you define spirit? Uh, my spirit, your spirit is the inside part of us, heart, mind, will, emotions, all those things. Right. So the Holy Spirit represents uh, God to us in those forms, all right? And he was always there. Uh, the Bible says he was there at creation. Uh, through him, the world was, was created. Uh, he's always been active and engaged. But what's unique uh, for the purposes of our discussion today is that with Jesus's atonement for our sins, um, the Bible says that we entered into a new kind of relationship with the Holy Spirit. Mm. And Jesus actually put it this way. He said to the disciples, you know, you're you're unhappy because I'm going away, but the truth is it's the best thing for you. And then he goes on to explain that by him physically returning to the Father, it meant that then God would be present with every one of us at all times and all places from the inside out. And, th and that's the beautiful thing, right? Yeah. You and I can have a great relationship when you're outside of me and I'm outside of you. But imagine, you know, if we were if, able if to we, understand yeah, the inside deepest, yes, of each yes, other. Yes. So that's what Jesus is saying. And um, with the advent of the Holy Spirit under the new covenant, to use biblical terms, uh, we are now indwelt by a spirit. And Jesus said, that's actually better because God can speak to me and you and anyone from the inside out, which means in with words, but also beyond words. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. And, and it kind of leads me into our, our next thought where, you know, it seems to me that maybe, I don't know, just thinking about it, that um, that could just be an extension of, of God the Father speaking oh, to absolutely. our spirits. Uh, so maybe what's so special about the Holy Spirit being distinctively one of the three persons of the Trinity and, and a separate entity, you know, a separate yeah. person, if that makes sense. So when we talk about these things, you know, uh, we are talking about ways to think about our relationship yeah. with God. Now, they represent a, a reality, okay? You know, to use the ancient term, God's essence, yep. you know, if we, yeah. they represent a reality, but they also exceed the reality they represent, right? So the Bible teaches us that, that when we've encountered Jesus, we've encountered the Father. Jesus says, you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? Yep. Uh, Peter tells us in Acts, uh, you know, when we lie to the Holy Spirit, we've lied to the Father, right? Yeah. So we mustn't think of them as independent, unique persons, but interdependent unique persons, right? So whenever I encounter Jesus, there's a sense in which I'm encountering the Holy Spirit. Whenever I encounter the Father, I'm encountering Jesus. Whenever I encounter Jesus, I'm encountering the Father. So um, don't, uh, we try to separate them, you know? The Holy Spirit is, is also called in Romans, the Spirit of Christ. Right? Yeah. So these things are, and we say, 
well, I don't know anything like that. Of course, we're talking about God. Right? Yeah, okay, that makes sense. And it almost seems to me, in other words, that nothing um, nothing that we invent to categorize God or try to understand God can be as full or true as true as the real thing. Yeah, right? imagine if you are trying to make yourself known uh, to a being that is so much less than you, maybe a goose. Yeah. Right? You know, you kind of need to define the parameters of revelation, right? Because no matter how hard the goose tries, they're going to get it wrong. Yeah. So in the scripture, in the Bible, we have the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that is the way God is choosing to reveal himself to us. Yeah. Because that's the best way for us to know him. So we may end up getting, you know, to heaven, to the end, to eternity, and realizing that it's so much more than we will will most likely realize that it's so much more than we ever imagined and that it's oh we had such a you know we'll look back and think oh that's such a a human understanding of it that will maybe transcend and go beyond that once we absolutely count on it because he is never ending right we are always going to be discovering more now nothing that we discover about him will contradict anything we already of know. Course, of course, of course. It'll just expand It'll on expand that. On. So more. the best analogy is a child. You yeah. know, when I knew my parents at six, I knew my parents. But at, at 60, I know my parents better, right? Yes. And it goes yes. on forever. So, yeah. Absolutely. Okay, that makes sense. So uh, we spent some time in the sermon, you spent some time talking about Elijah the prophet, right? Mm-hmm. And the fact that his great spiritual moments don't prevent him from sinking into this sort yeah. of depression. Yeah. Um, and I think that there's a stigma among some believers that depression as the mental health struggle that we understand it to be today is just maybe an indicator that our faith isn't strong enough that we aren't trusting God enough. Is it okay for believers to struggle with depression? Oh, it's not only okay, it's common. Yeah. Um, you know, the greatest believers in history, I, we could go through a list, have wrestled with that. But but maybe uh, not only does Elijah, the greatest prophet, you know, in the Old Testament, wrestle with that in the sermon, but also Jesus himself. Yeah. You know, from the cross cries out, God, why have you forsaken me? Right? I mean, wow. Uh, if That's not a failure of his faith. In that moment, he is doing the greatest thing he ever did on earth, which is atone for our sins, right? Yeah. Take our sins. So um, if he's going to struggle with that, you and I are going to struggle with that. Um, so no, no, no. There's no uh, sin in depression. You know, I think there can be sin in the ways that we respond to it or the ways that we try to um, cope or manage. Cope and all or that manage. Stuff. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, the, the things that we feel um, or, you know, depression more specifically is an inability to feel. Yeah. And uh, those things are, are part of the human condition. Yeah. And when Jesus said, God, why have you forsaken me? The father hadn't forsaken him. And God's love was no less uh, for the son in that moment, if we can put it that way. Uh, so when you and I struggle with it, we should never treat that struggle in itself as a failure. It never is. Got it. Um, yes. But only as a challenge. Yeah. You know? And then fo- to follow up on that then, is it okay for believers to seek worldly treatment for mental health? You so know, absolutely. therapy, uh, yeah. medication of any sort? Like, is that sort of something that we as believers should not kind of hold as a, as a stigma, yeah. you know? No, yes, we should. And now, um, having said that, yeah. okay, that doesn't mean that all mental health treatment that is offered to us is uh, effective or sufficient. proper or sufficient, right? So there is a place for all the tools of psychology. Here's what we want to be careful about, okay? The human tendency is to take psychology and derive theology from it. Yeah, or to take psychology, a legitimate science, and derive philosophy yeah. from it. That's the mistake, okay? If, if I wanna understand my physical condition and how it affects my mental condition, psychology can help me with that. If I want to understand my mental condition and how it relates to my spirit or God or my fellow man, no, now I need religion, now I need philosophy. So uh, we wanna embrace psychology as a tool for medical purposes, Yeah, but we don't generalize from psychology to religion or, yeah. ge- or to philosophy or to morality, yeah. right? So that's the distinction. Those tools are all there. They're meant for us. Christian psychology and counseling is a wonderful, uh, you know, science, mm-hmm. um, but uh, it's to be 
uh, distinguished from theology or philosophy. Yeah. yeah, and I think we as humans, humanity, in our hubris tend to sometimes, as soon as we gain some sort of understanding right. of something, we attempt to sort of apply that to every, everything else that we can. Right. You know? Yes, you're right. Um, on. Okay, so yeah, that's that's fantastic. Uh, you know, we also learn the importance of having a, uh, a quiet place of solitude. Mm-hmm. So we know that God sort of leads Elijah to this quiet place. Uh, we know also that Jesus often retreated to a quiet place to, yeah. to find solitude. Um, what's your quiet place or places? Yeah, yeah. that's Would a great question. You know, uh, mine. I, I've always been a very early riser. Okay? Yeah, I think I think the military did that to me back in the day. So between four thirty and five, I'm awake every morning, whether I want to be or not. And uh, my habit uh, in the morning has been to go. I usually go for five six mile walks in the morning. Uh, it's always in the dark. I'm always alone. And um, wow, that's a good spot. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, there's there's nothing to distract. You know, I can, I just have great conversations with the Lord uh, in those times. And, and that's mine. Uh, that time has, has been very precious to me. Now, you know, it happens at other times, Tuesdays when I'm preparing a message for Sunday, you know, that's mm-hmm. my doors closed, as yep. you know. So there are other times, but that's, I would say, if you ask me for where my center of gravity is, it's that's your go-to walks. place. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and if, if you're watching, if you want to jump down in the comments, maybe let us know what your quiet place yeah, is if you cool. have one. Uh, yeah. I'd be curious to see uh, mm-hmm. what you know what people are experiencing. So, uh, okay, moving on. I think sometimes as uh, we as believers feel like we have a responsibility to be louder than what's going on in the world. <laughs> we talked about this a little bit in this sermon. You mentioned that yeah. you know when we are. Uh, to use the analogy, when we're distracted by the loudness of the world, we are sort of uh, unable to be quiet enough to hear that whisper, to hear the Holy Spirit, right? Less able to. And I think sometimes we feel like we have to be louder than what's going on in the world to get our point across or to, to share what Jesus is doing. Does this idea of being still and listening for the whisper from God translate into how we as believers ought to speak into the world? Uh, you know, yes and no. Yeah. Uh, I, I think sometimes, yes. Um, you know, the consistent, the reason where the message comes from is that the consistent testimony of God's word is that those times of solitude and silence are healthy for everybody. Yeah. Now there, you know, some of us may need it more than others, but, um, but, you know, to use Jesus's uh, word picture, he says, when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father in secret because um, we are most authentic when we're alone with God. So, yeah, but there are times when we shout, uh, you know, Jesus went to public places and taught and Jesus, uh, you know, engaged people in public. So uh, it's not either or. But what I have found, uh, and this is experiential, is that most people, uh, if, they, if they're going to let go of the loud or the quiet, they let go of the quiet. You yeah. know? And they don't have a space in their life to be alone in, a, in, a, in quietness. Uh, with God. And, you know, we can hear him, uh, you know, in a crowd or even in loud, but there's a way that we hear him best in quiet. Yeah. And, and that's consistent, the prophets, Jesus, the apostles. So for us to carve that out, I think is the most practical way to help ourselves be in a mm-hmm. listening posture to God, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And I think, again, like with so many other aspects of our faith, there's just this tendency to want to find one way to do it right. and focus on that, right? right? It's like, oh, well, this is, you know, that seems to be the danger is when we don't consider that there are, there is a balance. Because we know that Jesus often did go into public places. Right. There was, But he also often went to small backwater mm-hmm. places and said, hey, we're going to go to this quiet place and I'm going to I'm gonna whisper to the people there and teach there for a time. You know, there's both ends. Definitely. And, you know... Uh, I think sometimes we want to be careful with the word balance because there is a clear priority. Yes. You know, uh, you, you know, you'll be all right getting silent without loud. You might struggle loud without silent. Right? Yeah, so, for sure. Um, both, as you pointed out, both are very important, but one may be more significant. There's, there's an aspect of discernment, yeah. right, that comes into it. And that's something that we grow you into bet. as believers. Okay, to round us out here with this final question. Uh, Something that I've been asked before that I've asked as a question myself before yeah. many times. Uh, how can we determine if what we're sort of hearing from within is our own inner thoughts or if it's the Holy Spirit speaking great. to us? Really great question, Brent. And, you know, that's the challenge is that when God speaks to us from within, we just assume that everything within is us. Yeah. And so it, it takes some distinction. So how does that happen? Well, just like a little baby growing up, mm-hmm. uh, a child as it develops increasingly gains the ability to discern their parents' voices. 
at first, you know, they identify that as parents and as time goes by, they get, it gets more acute and, you know, eventually they get to the point uh, where they can pick it out of a crowd. Okay. That's a process. It doesn't happen in a moment. So um, how do we learn to distinguish? Well, first of all, quiet, have a quiet space. Mm -hmm. Second of all, understand that Jesus also said the Holy Spirit wouldn't speak on his own. He, he, to use Jesus' the words, he said, he'd take from what is mine and make it known to you. So when we go to the scriptures, our learning of God's word enables us to recognize the tone of God's voice, if you will, when we hear it from inside. And the longer we listen to that voice of scripture, Jesus, more clearly are we able to distinguish, you know, the inner voices. Uh, you know, and I would just say as someone who's, you know, been a believer for 40 years, it just increases as time goes by. Yeah. And increasingly you're able to note, oh gosh, that was clearly God because, you know, I wouldn't have thought of that, you yeah. know, or I wouldn't have discerned that. Uh, need or that priority or that imperative. So uh, it's a process. I like to put it this way, and uh, I, I don't want to cut you off, but I like to put it this way, is that the more we know God's word, it's like increasing your vocabulary in a foreign language. Yeah. Right? So I've been in a country, many countries that have other languages, and the first few days you're there, you can't recognize anything. The longer you're there, you start going, oh yeah, Picking yeah, 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 right? You just start learning it. And it's the same with God. The more we listen to Jesus, the more we listen to God's word as a whole, the more we identify what's going on in our heads that is him. Yeah. And, and I think that we tend to want to, um, we want it to sound a specific way, right? Like, yeah. oh, how do I recognize what it sounds like? But we don't focus as much on, well, we'll recognize it, not necessarily based on what it sounds like, but what the content of it is, right? What the words that are being spoken is. And there's this big aspect. You know? Absolutely. I know that you've been married now for a few yes. years, right? Oh, well, yeah. One of the things that happens in a marriage, right, is that you begin to recognize each other's looks yep. and, and tones yep. and body language, all this kind of stuff. The same thing happens in our relationship with God, you know? As time goes on, you know, my wife and I are about to celebrate our 40th, right? Yeah. We can have pretty involved conversations without hardly saying anything. Yeah. Because we have this shared common experience. So the, the same is true in our relationship with God. The longer we walk with him, uh, the more this vocabulary grows, the more this familiarity grows, the more this intimacy grows. You just pick out more and more and more. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that happens with married couples over a long lifetime is you can just sense each yeah. other's um, moods, thoughts, feelings, priorities. You can just sense all that, you know, in a beyond words way, which circles back to the original point. That's why Jesus says better the Holy Spirit. Yeah. You know, the Holy Spirit from the inside of us can communicate with us on a level far beyond the cognitive. Yeah. It includes the cognitive, but it goes far beyond. And that's even, that's greater and deeper relationship than having another person, i.e. Right. Jesus, just telling you what, you know, you should be doing or whatever. When exactly. You can sense that. And that's why Jesus said, hey, this is a good thing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, well, fantastic. Uh, to close out the show, if you could leave folks with one short encouragement or reminder to focus on from the sermon, what would you say? Yeah, it's to make that space. You know, I'm going to talk about in the message. We're talking 10 minutes a day max, right? But 10 minutes of listening to God, you know, I, I'm tempted to say five minutes. You know, if you get alone with him and intently listen, you know, um, you know, one of the points we made is to go back to your thing about how do we discern the Holy Spirit will never disagree with Jesus. Mm -hmm. He will amplify and expand on what he said, but it will always be consistent with him. So, you know, the way I do it is when I go into those listening spaces mm -hmm. is I start off with the Lord's Prayer, you know. And then I go into some silence and then I begin to talk and I'm not afraid when I'm with the Lord to stop talking and just listen, you know, and the way he communicates is sometimes words, but other times it's, it's moods, it's, um, you know, reflections, it's, um, uh, feelings, yeah. you know, and I can recognize those. We can recognize those as being consistent because they're consistent with Jesus. They're consistent with God's word. They're consistent with our growing experience and all of that. 
And it's encouragement for new believers that oh. because it's a process, it's yes. not something that we get zapped with and all of a sudden right. we, oh, what am I missing? Because we, we learn how to do this. And so as new believers, we should be encouraged that this will develop as we grow. Yes, right? definitely. But, you know, imagine a, a six month old who's trying to learn to recognize their parents and siblings' voices, getting upset with themselves because it's taking too long, right? Yeah. No, yeah. no, no, just keep going. It's part of the just process. Keep yeah. Fantastic. Well, that is all for this episode, folks. Greg, thank you so much for sharing with us and thank you for joining us for another episode of Going Deeper.